sound strong beyond my ears But they don't see inside of me I'm hiding all the tears They don't When I fall down, they don't know who picks me up when no one is around. I drop my sword and cry for just a while. It's deep inside this armor. The war. You can use the back of the paper. I, I'm gonna write something there. Um, um, preferably your copy, so I can leave it to, to, to you. We know the birthday of Christ was. Uh, it's not December. We all know that. But did you know that we can know where when it is? Because. We ministered for three and a half years. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if you ministered for three and a half years, when was he baptized? On this? Thirtieth birthday. So you know, he was about thirty when he was baptized. So his uh, baptism was near his birthday. So if he ministered for three and a half years. The difference between his birthday and his death is half year. Three and a half years. Or remove the whole numbers, we have half year. So half year from his death, when will that be? Did you know when he died? No. That is the reason of Passover. That is the reason of our topic tonight. Because... He died on a Passover. And God gave that date long time in the time of Moses. And God already commanded Israel to celebrate the feast of the Passover. 
that's for the death of Jesus Christ. So, it transmuted to the Gentile period, the church Christianity in the New Testament period, in the form of communion. You've heard of communion, right? The Lord's Supper, the taking of bread. We're going to talk about tonight the original way the apostles did the communion. Because what we have today in our churches is not the original way. They are uh, evolved. <laughs> They've been evolved with human tradition. So, let's talk about the... Summer, summer. Today is not yet summer. Okay. Today is spring. spring. That's why you can read it there. Eh? Okay. You can read it there uh, in Communion 2006. Okay. He died on a spring... What? what in, uh, because Brother Barnham mentioned... Uh, he was born on April, that was spring. We knew he died on spring. We, he died on on Passover. So, his birth is half a year from that date. So, we can know his birth. So, what you're reading here is the birth. I'm talking about birthday. Uh, there's a type for how we celebrate birthdays. We could celebrate birthdays in ignorance of uh, what God intended it to be or we can know the revelation of God so that we do the perfect will of God if ever we do celebrate birthdays we do not celebrate it in ignorance anymore um, our birthday is tied to Christ's birthday but when was Christ when did Christ when was Christ born let's look at this chart this is spring We have summer. Maybe you've heard of summer solstice. Or spring equinox. I'll explain. Spring, they call it equinox, the high point. The daytime and nighttime is equal. Because as the earth turns around the sun, they are in a point wherein, it, even though it, the earth is sideways to the sun, it receives equal sunlight day and night. But when the earth moves uh, where in a point where it's facing the sun or facing away the sun, tilted, there is uh, a, a, a time of the day where daytime is longer than nighttime or nighttime is longer than daytime. That's when you call solstice. That's where you, when you say solstice. That's why summer, you don't say equinox. You, summer, you call it solstice. Summer, solstice. And winter, solstice. Where is winter? On the other side. After uh, fall. Winter, solstice. Winter, solstice is when Semiramis made December 25, the birthday of Actually, that's the birthday of Tammuz, which is um, a pagan deity, uh, uh, sun through incest. But it was made into... There, there are many other gods na to be connected with December 25. But it came from the same person. Be, uh, Nimrod, if you heard of him, then Tammuz. Then his birthday became was made into the birthday of Christ by Catholics. And today, churches that celebrate Christmas, they celebrate in ignorance, they're celebrating the birthday of Tammuz. They're just saying it's the birthday of Christ. But Christ is a general word. So, it, it, yes, Messiah. So, it would, it would turn out that they're calling the, what shall we say, the son of a devil as the Messiah out of ignorance and how they celebrate let me just go further from here they put uh, mistletoe they they create a christmas tree those were the original pagan practices of semiramis he taught that to the people when nimrod his son and husband was killed so the people were taught corruption and that corruption entered into Christianity through the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church 
use December 25 to win the pagans over. But in winning pagans, they paganize Christianity. And uh, Christianity today, they don't know. They celebrate not just the date. They celebrate the same way with the Christmas tree. Uh, I might have uh, focused more on this subject. But since we are here, let's read in the Bible. Before the time of Christ, that was already celebrated. Let's open up. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 10. You're familiar with that, right? <laughs> okay. Let's open in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1 to 4. Uh, could you read for us? Um, Jeremiah 10, 1. Hear what the Lord says to you, people of Israel. This, this is what the Lord says. Do not learn the ways of the nations or the terrified by signs in the heavens. Through the nations are terrified by them. Three, for the practices of the peoples, uh, peoples are worthless. They cut a tree out of a forest. And the craftsman shape, shapes it with his chisel. For, and the, they adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nail so it will not tatter. And next verse 5. 5. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field. Their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. So, verse, verse 5. Okay, now, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 10, that's an example of what became the Christmas tree. For they don't call it a Christmas tree. They call it a, a winter solstice tree, a yuletide tree. It became known as Christmas tree because Christianity was attached to it. But the practice of Christmas tree was originally pagan. And the churches today don't know what they're doing. Okay? That's why you ask the question, progressive celebration. Pro we need a progressive revelation in what we are celebrating. We should not celebrate in, in ignorance. If we were ignorant before, God can forgive us. We just need to repent from our earlier ignorance. Our hearts should always be hungering for revelation. That's our repentance. Repentance from ignorance. Uh, even though we don't know, don't know everything yet, but our hearts, God knows our hearts, we are open for correction, we're not close-minded. And we really want, yearn for His revelation. That's progressive revelation. And regarding progressive revelation, if before we were celebrating Christmas according to the denominational traditions, right now we have to go back to the original. Our topic last time was restoration, remember? A topic last time was going back to the original. Going back to the original apostolic teachings. Because that is God's way of uh, preparing us to be caught away to be, to, for the rapture. Before He He wants us in our hearts to desire uh, going back to the original truths. Okay, now, um, with, so with regards to the Christmas tree, when they said cut a tree from the forest, put many decorative gold there, that's that's the beginning. It's in the Old Testament. Even from the Old Testament, even from the Old Testament, that practice was already there. You can check it up in the encyclopedia, in the internet. It was already there. The the, the Catholics, the Protestants, they will not deny it. They just say, let's not make too much fuss about it. Let's let the people be happy. But the problem is, you want them to be happy out of ignorance. That's not God's way. Okay, so. Um, okay, let's get back to the birth of Christ. The birth, Tamos is also in the Bible, but it's December 25. Tamos is in Ezekiel 8. So, I'm just reading it as a reference, you can take it down. We're not gonna read it. Because that, this kind of knowledge is very common in, among Baptists. Some evangelicals and mostly Baptists, Presbyterians, like that. Eight. Tamos is there. Women were crying for Tamos. They're facing the sun. They're facing east. There's another topic for that. But uh, I just gave some example of uh, the son of Nimrod, where December 25 started out. Okay. 
So when Brother Benji said there are many other gods celebrating December 10th, those are from the same one the uh, idol. They spread out into different names. That's why they still still celebrate the same thing, the same date. So it's a God-given season, eh? Winter solstice. Winter solstice. So imagine the Earth. It's divided into four. Uh, winter, spring, summer, fall. Now, let's look at this as half year. Half year from spring is what is the date? Let's say spring is around April, March and April. Half year from that. Can you count? Between March? Yes. Uh, go forward or backward half a year. Six months. Okay. Where will it fall? <laughs> September and October. So, springtime is around March and April. Now, uh, the fall, autumn, is in September or October. This is the date, this is the time when Christ was born, the fall. And if you are going to understand that track, 2006, why did God intend for Christ to be born on a fall and die on a spring? Isn't it spring represents rebirth? Spring represents life. If you understand the seasons, all things sleep, all things almost die during winter. In the fall, the leaves fall down, and in winter, they sleep. But in spring, they reawaken again. Rebirth. So, why would God intend for Christ to die on a spring and be born on a fall? Doesn't make any sense for the carnal mind. But if we're going to have God's revelation, God intended us to have life by resurrection. Because our first birth was sin. That's why God intended Christ's birth to, f to fall on an autumn. Let's talk about birthdays. God was showing us Christ, who had no sin, would be born on a fall. That means to say, death. In, in, in earth seasons, it represents death. Uh, in the gifts, there was this gift, um, mirror. Yes. I think it's for the dead. <laughs> good. The gifts of the wise men. Good. Uh, good addition. Christ's birth was not to be celebrated in a pagan way with pomp and pageantry. It's commercialism. Christ's birth was to be celebrated like a funeral service. His real birthday was the His resurrection. Let's open our Bible. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 18. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 18. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is the firstborn. Let, we're talking about birth. His birthday. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. You see, God was focusing on the resurrection to be the real birthday of Jesus Christ. Because even though he was created perfect like the first Adam, he has to pass through tests. He still has to overcome. If he does not overcome, God will not still concern him a son. The sonship for God means to overcome, to be worthy as a son. Galatians 4.1 uh, this would have something to do with our children. Let's read Galatians 4.1. Our children could be our heirs, but we do not give, them, give it immediately to them. 
every wise parent would train their children first before giving them the inheritance. The same with Christ. Galatians 4.1 for one. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. So, the child, even though he is an heir, he should not be babied, he or she. He must be trained. And to extend it a little further to what we were teaching about family, um, in the church that I'm teaching, I'm teaching the parents to use authority on their children. They must not be pampered. Example, what I said a while ago, call them here, call, uh, call her here to read. She will obey. If she obeys, but you, without knowing it, you are going to transfer her excitement to the Word of God. That's one of the things I teach because parents never realize that. Parents never realized that. So, I had a hard time because, of course, there are some other pastors who are going against me about that. But, this is in the Word of God. I stand by the Word of God. Let them accuse me of many, many things. But I stand by the Word of God. God will vindicate me. Okay, Even though I'm not, I will be unpopular. <laughs> so, um, with regards to Galatians 4.1, a child differs nothing from a servant. He or she is under training. Please read verse 2. Verse 2. But he is under guardians and managers until the day set by the Father. Okay. So that was Christ. And not just Christ, that is also us. So let's talk about birthday. The first birth of Christ was his funeral service. The death of Christ, that's his birthday. And more so for us, he wa he had no sin. But the purpose of Christ was for us. We were sinners. The reason our first birth, our birthdays, is supposed to be a funeral service is because uh, do you have a we were born in sin. We should not be happy about it. A scotch paper. I so our real birthday is also in the resurrection. Right. That's the time we will be made in the image of God. That's the time let God said, let us make man in our image. Oh, I remember we, we want to talk about that in the next meeting. But okay, the tabulation is in the other page. It's supposed to be back to back. <laughs> this is the Lord's Supper tabulation. Uh, I edited this in 2007. Uh, revised it. So it was made earlier than 2006, but I revised it in 2007, okay, so there's the date. Now if we look at the frequency, the frequency, please read the frequency of the original practice. This one? Yes, look at the frequency. It's somewhere in the second to the last. Frequency. Original practice. I'll write something. Uh, weekly. Original practice. Oh, okay. Original practice coincides with Passover, unleavened bread, versus Matthew 26, 17, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 to 8, 11 to 23, same night, do in remembrance. So let's open our scriptures. I think the word do in remembrance is not in Matthew 26, but in Luke but I forgot the verse. 22 verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When Christ said, Do this, he was talking about their celebration of Passover. He didn't say, You can do this anytime you want. How often were they doing it? They were doing that every year. Since the time of Moses. When God commanded Moses, at the beginning of the year, Nisan, on the 14th, you should celebrate the feast of the Passover and the unleavened bread. It's not any time of the year. It's not any time you want. Or how often you want it. How often God commanded it. 
it's once a year. Once a year also has something in connection with Hebrews. The blood of bulls and goats once a year. Maybe you can look at uh, the types and shadows. Let's go to the right side. Like a high priest once a year type once and for all. There's Hebrews 10.10. 10. Once and for all. Uh, compared to uh, once a year the high priest enters the most holy place for the day of atonement. The same thing also Passover. Once a year. Because the, what I drew a while ago, springtime is rebirth. And Christ didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave. So the so the so the vicinity of that season is very important. If you if we conduct communion in some other date, we lost the type. If we lost the type, we lost the purpose of God. We should not consider it as a a communion ritual. We should consider it just ordinary breaking of bread, ordinary. Uh, um, feasting of food, salo salo like that. Ordinary taking of food, uh, not uh, the yearly ritual. This yearly ritual, they have finished their supper, then Christ made the type for the bread, because it's a yearly celebration that they should uh, cook unleavened bread. And um, no offense to other churches of which you may have been encountering. The, the the way they use bread is not always unleavened. Sometimes they use biscuits. Let's go to the let's go to the tabulation at the at the bread here. It's tradition in evolves. The tradition evolves. Okay. Tradition evolves. Traditions evolve. Uh, for the bread. Round wafer discs, biscuits, tasty pan bread. So, have you encountered that? I've encountered this. Yes, and, so they they lost they lost the revelation. They lost the revelation why it should be unleavened bread. If you substitute, you lost. You should not consider it as a the communion commandment, the Lord's Supper anymore. You should consider it as ordinary. Um, ordinary sacred meal of sharing uh, the meal with each other while sharing the word of God. But this is once a year. This should be done with unleavened bread. It's written in Exodus 12. That's the verse I quote about Moses. Let's look at the original practice. Matthew 26, Exodus 12. Now there is a type. Did you know that in Matthew, not not 26, Matthew 16, remember this verse. He said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What, are, what do you mean by type? Representing. Yes, symbolizing. So, beware of the leaven. In Matthew 16, what was Christ talking about? When he said, Matthew 16, I forget the verse, maybe verse 11. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Verse 11, how is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? He was talking about the doctrines. So, the, the disciples thought the Pharisees and Sadducees were putting leaven in the bread. No, they were strict to the letter. They followed to the letter. Do not unleaven bread. But they, Christ was pointing out, leaven represents many things. One of them is false doctrines. He can read continuously. He will. He's going to talk about doctrines. Twelve. Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, let me ask you, uh, let's some form of exam. Uh, as we talked about last, last time we were here, um, what was the teaching that angers Christ, the teaching of the Sadducees and the Pharisees? Paul's 
teaching? Yes. They could commit mistake with false teaching. But there's what I say a master key that is hated by Christ in the book of Revelation, which things I hate. You bring to them the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The mm-hmm. doctrines of the Nic- what you, you remember I talked about Nicolaitanism? Nicolaitanism is preventing a person from becoming Berean. Uh, remember I shared about being Berean. If you're going to be restored, we're going to walk in the light, progressive revelation, we need to be Berean. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees were preventing people from becoming Berean. Similar to the churches today, from Catholic Church, Protestant churches, Pentecostal churches, some anti-message churches, they constrict their followers from listening to others. That's a wrong doctrine. Don't listen to them. Don't associate with them. They're, they're, they could easily mark anyone they don't like. So the person do not grow anymore. The person only turns around in what their denomination teaches. So only listen to our affiliate churches. Or our affiliate churches are Trinitarian churches. Do not listen to other who are not Trinitarians like them. Do not listen who are... So, Nicolaitan spirit is the doctrine that Jesus Christ hates. Not just doctrine and deeds also. That is the false teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They try to prevent the people from listening to Christ. Christ was constantly proven to them by scriptures. He was the promised Messiah. And Christ said, you would not check, search the scriptures, for they testify of me, but you would not. So, they're, they're preventing the people to be Berean, to be objective, to prove all things. Is that leaven? Uh, maybe several decades ago, some decade ago, I might explain leaven to be false teachings, like wrong baptism, baptism in not in Jesus' name, uh, wrong understanding of the Godhead, or many other. But now I realize it's not just that. Those are those are small time compared to the Nicolaitan spirit, because we all commit mistake. All pastors commit mistake. What they need is a, just a humble heart to be corrected with the word. So if you have that humble heart, this Berean spirit, then we do not have to mark each other out. We do not need to close each other's minds. We just need to sit down and study who is correct in the scriptures with humility, with honesty. Then we can grow, walk in the light, progressive revelation. No pride. I belong to a big denomination. Why should I listen to you? You're you're small time. That, that, that same spirit that take, took place in the time of Christ. So the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees is Nicolaitan spirit. That is where, where false, false doctrines would multiply. Because if the, people, if, you, if the people start to close their minds, then they would entertain many uh, my, my, uh, mythical beliefs. <laughs> so Christians are most commonly seen as killjoys. They could not enjoy many things other people enjoy. We're not just talking about the world, we're talking about the original. Maybe some things which some de- denominational churches enjoy are not re- in reality acceptable to God, are not in reality kosher to God. <laughs> Maybe their dress, mini skirt, a hemline, worldly music, Today's uh, fun, uh, churches now are, are accepting worldly music already. So, many other things. There is a uh, apostasy taking place. Of course, that apostasy was a uh, long time ago. But today, those churches that were once called out by God, they're also starting to apostatize. Why? Because when they formed a denomination, they became Nicolaitan. They could make a club wherein we only believe what our group, within our group. We do not accept uh, uh, those outsiders who have, who have cropped up some newer revelations. 
So, um, there are many scarecrows also outside. But same also in the Latin spirit. Let's say there came out the INK, Iglesia ni Cristo of Manalo, ADD, ang dating daan, ACQ, Apolo Kibuloy, and uh, many others, LDS, Latter-day Saints, Jehovah's Witnesses, SDA, Seventh-day Adventists. The more the denominations will close their minds. Oh, there are false teachings out there. Do not listen to anyone. But how do you overcome false teachings? Proving all things. You don't just listen to one side. Get their side also. But this spirit, this Berean spirit, is not very much practiced within the denominations. Most of the time, the ordinary members, they're, uh, they're just implanted with a spirit of fear. But if we receive the spirit of God, we do not receive the spirit of fear. We receive the spirit of liberty. We're not controlled like Martin Luther was. He, uh, the church tried, the Catholic Church tried to control him. But we are free to go to the scriptures and prove all things. That's the liberty given to us by the Spirit. Now let's go back to this um, tabulation. If you notice, let's go to the traditions evolved. The bread has leaven, whatever form it has. Let, what about the drink? Please read the Brother JV, the drink of the traditions evolved. Uh, grape juice, cola drinks, and water. Now, how many of you have encountered this? Grape juice, okay. I encountered water in the Mormons. I just saw it in their t literature. Maybe some others would use soft drinks. Have you heard of them, using soft drinks? Maybe someone else. I just put it here, just in case. So, that is the tradition evolved. What is the original? Was it the juice? What is the original? When Christ with fruit of the vine. Wine. Wine. Now, how would you know the fruit of the vine is not grape juice, and but red grape wine? It said here, red grape wine. It should be red because Christ said, this is my blood. How can you use a different color like violet? This is my blood. It's not a vampire. <laughs> it's a human, right? Right. So, red grape wine. Why should it? Why was it grape? It's fruit of the vine. Why was it? Why should it be wine and not juice? You know why? Because he symbolized it. He typed it to his blood. He typed the wine to his blood. He used the wine to symbolize his blood. And why should it be wine and not juice? What happens to the juice overnight? Spoil. Spoil. It spoils. But what happens to the wine as you age it? Even for thousands of years. What happens to the wine if, as it ages? It, uh, it becomes. It becomes better. Better. It becomes better. That's why it's not wine. It's not juice. What they did, what Christ used to symbolize his blood was not juice. It's wine. Because his blood is effective for 2,000 years. Until today, to anyone who will hear the message. How about juice? Just overnight, it's spoiled. And... What happens to the churches who have this typology? If you lost this typology and you're saying you're, you're conducting the Lord's Supper, you, sorry to say, no offense meant, you are blaspheming His message, His typology, His symbolism. It, we, we might as well not conduct it rather than blaspheme Him because we will represent him. It's like the Catholic Church. They modify some Jewish rituals. This is what I can say. It's not meant, wine was not meant to be drank and, uh, in excess. In, the, in Proverbs, it is the excess of wine. If you only taste that once a year, a little sip, Paul taught Timothy to take a little sip for the stomach, right? You use it as medicine. You don't use it for excess. 
Okay, so for a drinking spree or drinking binge. So I believe if you take a lot small step just for the purpose of uh, fulfilling God's uh, plan, will you will not have that uh, uh, that feeling of uh, that old uh, vice coming back in your in your flesh. I believe you will not feel that kind of uh, um, uh, that sensation, especially if every night you have uh, this what I could call cell group uh, a buffer report to the family. It will kill your flesh, the desires of your flesh. So if you, if you if it could be done the correct way, let's say we did it. If we did it, I believe in the spirit of God in our presence, the the fleshly abuse of that wine will not be reactivated. It will not. I knew some people who are drug addicts before, and just because they restored in fellowship, that revived in praise and worship. You know, withdrawal from drugs is very painful. They have withdrawal symptoms. But he didn't experience any symptom. Mm-hmm. It takes months to withdraw, but he didn't take months instantly because he committed to serve God. That person was committed to serving in music. He told me, I should, have, I should spend several months of suffering, but no longer. Because if you do it in... In the presence of God, God will take care of you. Okay? So nothing to worry about on that side. Uh, tomorrow, if ever you attend our communion service, I believe you will not feel that that uh, fleshly urge. Because there's sharing of the word. Wine represents the stimulation of the spirit. in the, the fire in experiencing the revelation of the word of God. Like right now, while we're talking, as I experienced since my youth, do you feel the presence of God in the Word? As you see the Word of God revealing something new to you, do you feel that fire within your heart? That is represented by that wine. Because when you drink a real wine, not grape juice, you feel you'll feel some uh, heat coming down your um, throat. It's the same feeling of those drunk with the Spirit. I'm not saying drunk uncontrollably. They have revival in the Spirit. That's why in Pentecost, some thought they were drunk. If when they were not drunk with them, they were drunk with the Spirit of God. So being drunk with the Spirit is will be drunk in this revelation. We take bread. You know in the time of Exodus, there was no wine. God did not command. I'm, I'm not saying there's no wine. Saying God did not command them to make to use wine. There's no typology of the wine in Exodus 12. But in the time of Christ, Christ added the wine. Why? The word of God is the bread of life. But we need the revelation of the Spirit. Because the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So we need the revelation of the Spirit. We need the stimulation. This is the Berean Spirit also what I'm saying. That we will hunger and thirst. We will have revival in receiving revelations from God. It's the Spirit that's giving us revelation. So, uh, let me quote a verse related to that. Let's open First Corinthians chapter 2. This is not in the Lord's Supper. So, we're just taking a short glimpse of this feeling, what I'm saying, about this stimulation to revelation. We start with verse 6, uh, going to verse 13. Chapter, chapter 2, verse 6. So, okay, verse 6 and verse 7. Verse until verse 12. No. Yes, until verse 13. First Corinthians, verse 2, 6. How about How great we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor nor of the princess of this world that come to know. Verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, 
even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Praise for to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. 13. That is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with the Spirit taught word. Comparing spiritual things is spiritual. That's being variant. You compare things. As you compare things, you prove all things, but which is right, the perfect will of God, then you want to hear the uh, Christian, King James okay. Version. Um, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 13, Which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. You will feel the Word of God more. So, the complete form of worship is speaking the Word, not just hearing the word how are you going to speak the word comparing spiritual things with spiritual being beren you study you, you let's say the tracks we're going to leave to you or even the previous literatures day and night you have to open it up Acts 17 11 remember searching the scriptures daily so every chance you got even your children tell them to open up that's the that's where you're going to get the 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 words to speak because you cannot speak anything without studying them. Okay? So, let's look at this tabulation. Let's jump to the partaking. The partaking, they just feed, traditionally, they just spoon feed the bread by the priest or every, every individual take the bread by themselves. Here, let's read the original practice. Uh, please read, Brother Jay. Like yeah, manner. original practice. In like manner of Christ's supper, meal and breaking of bread and sharing the cup. First Corinthians eleven twenty three to twenty five, Matthew twenty six verse twenty six to twenty eight. They share the word of God while they have the meal. And what should they do with the the bread? Let's go up to the bread. It, did, it wasn't written here, except here in a digit symbol. Ah, ah, let's go back to partaking. The breaking of bread. Uh, let me use this as an example. Let's say this is the unleavened bread. I'm going to break this. Of course, it should be bigger. <laughs> As the head of the family breaks the bread, the wife, the firstborn, the children break the bread, or the helpers. Breaking the bread represents the rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth means we study something, a part of that verse, and we share it collectively in a fellowship. That's the original form of worship. So I'm going to take this opportunity to jump to Let's look at this tabulation. Spiritual portrayal under partaking. Uh, type and shadow, spiritual portrayal. Home and church cell group, word sharing. Hebrews 9.25, what does it say? I'm curious what NIV would say. Uh, verse 25, not forsaking, forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Encouraging. 
Oh, how about you? Same? And the NSB at the end. Okay, what's yours? NIV. Okay. Uh, in, in a, in a, in a, in a, okay. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see that they approach you. Encouraging also. Okay, King James. Mm -hmm. mm, Hebrews 10 verse 25 Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching Encouraging? Uh, exhorting. exhorting Okay Do you have Tagalog? No? You don't have When you say exhorting in church what does it mean? Same as encouraging Correcting. Correct? Correct? Eh? Uh, exhorting could also be preaching uh, preaching the word sharing the word encouragement can also be preaching when brethren gather together they should have prepared a revelation to contribute that is the original form of worship Hebrews 10 and 5 exhorted is a better word because means you, you, you exhort with the word of God you speak to the word of God, 1 Corinthians 13. Last ver uh, let me add another verse. Maybe it's written here. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. Maybe you can mark it out in your tracks so you can easily see. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Okay, please read. I'd like to hear different versions of that. 14, 26. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. So the same, Nasbi. Uh, what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. So, that's original form of worship. 1 Corinthians 14.26, Hebrews 10.25, 1 Corinthians 2.13. This is what was um, hidden in, in communion Passover, in this practice. It was hidden here. The family would gather together. They will break bread. They break bread representing each one taking, lightly dividing the word of truth, taking a portion of the progressive revelation in the time that the message of the hour, then sharing it. When they partake of wine, they will have stimulation over bread. So the pipe is the body, when you take wine, you feel warm, down from your throat, down to your stomach. The same thing that you feel warm as we share the progressive revelation. And this is the original form of worship. It's hidden in this practice. This practice is for home cell group and, house and church cell group. Even in church, there, there needs to be a cell group. If there's no cell group, what will happen to the church? The church will just be an evangelistic meeting. Evangelistic meeting. If you remember a copy of 2008, you have the truck or you have the, in the internet. I have a drawing. Maybe last time I gave it, give, give it to you a copy. You have a copy. Communion 2008. There was a drawing there. Christ preaching to the crowd. There was also... Another drawing, he commanded them to be organized into groups. Then he gave them the bread and fish. And the bread and fish multiplied in the groups. See? God is giving us the power to multiply the bread and fish.
by the hand and help me face the rising sun. Comfort me through all the pain that life may bring. There's no other hope that I can lean upon. Lead me, Lord. Lead me all my life. Walk by me. Walk by me across the lonely roads that I may face. Take my arms and let your hand show me the way. Show the way to live inside your heart. All my days, all my life, you are my. All the time, my Lord, I need. 